Roberts and Roberts Brokerage and Libertopia are pleased to present Bitcoin, a force for good and accountability, featuring MK Lords, Davi Barker, and Drew Phillips of Bitcoin Not Bombs, and Angela Keaton of Antiwar.com. We'll be talking about Bitcoin charities uh, with a focus on accountability and transparency. So uh, on the panel today, I have Angela Keaton of Antiwar.com and Davi Barker and Drew Phillips from Bitcoin Not Bombs. And I'm also the editor at Bitcoin Not Bombs. Uh, thanks for joining me. Uh, really briefly, we're going to go through the history of each organization, kind of how it started, um, its goals, and uh, yeah, its motivations. Oh, hi. I'm Angela Keaton. I'm the director of operations for antiwar.com, and we proudly and gladly take all your Bitcoin. <laughs> well, kind of how did it start? Like how did oh. antiwar start? Oh, we're getting started. Oh, okay, yes. great. Okay, um, okay. Several reasons. One, basic consumer d donor demand. We had enough donors asking about Bitcoin because given who our donors are and who our readers are, these tend to be kind of tech-savvy people. Antiwar.com is based in San Francisco, which is actually historically the home of many great libertarian um, organizers and ideas and institutions came from San Francisco. So Bay Area has always been sort of a tech and progressive hub and the locals loved the idea. So that was part of the reason. Um, also, because Drew Phillips, the man at the end here, did a lot of high pressuring of me, calling me, emailing, texting, and saying, look, you need to take this, and this is how easy it is. And once it became really easy, then I was really sold. But we had to kind of sell, I had to kind of sell our board, board members and our webmaster and others on it, because libertarians, and we could probably talk a little bit about this later, is that we tend to be really, we love new ideas and we love to be innovators and we love to be on the cutting edge, but we also tend to get scammed a lot. And I'm pretty much, my, my default assumption in the libertarian movement is that most things are a scam until proven otherwise. That's how I kind of start with the assumption, so I'm rarely disappointed. And sometimes I'll try to benefit from the, from the legitimate parts of the scam as long as I can, but then click it off when it finally jumps the shark, as somebody keeps saying all weekend. Um, but it's important though, I mean, Bitcoin has tested, it's been being tested, and you can also, because of the blockchain, you can sort of see what transactions look like with your nonprofit. So it's just sort of a buyer beware, but you know, we've been doing Bitcoin long enough to where we keep it really simple, we don't do a lot of fancy things with the Bitcoin, we just sort of are looking at it as this is a way, um, one, that people can do donate discreetly, that they can be somewhat private in the ch their choices of charities and their political statements, as well as also, too, not everyone wants to have everything tracked by the IRS. So it makes really sense for, it made sense for us to accept Bitcoin. All right. Davi? You want to field this one, or is this me? What was the question? How did we get started as Bitcoin Not Bombs? I finally convinced Angela to start taking Bitcoin. Yeah, that's, no, um, that's it. essentially, we're an organization that seeks out you know, groups like antiwar.com and twist their arm until they take Bitcoin. And then uh, we try to run a, a campaign fundraiser, sort of we do some promotional products and flyers and things like that to, to make sure that their first, um, their first Bitcoin fundraising drive is a success. So uh, we started out doing this for antiwar.com, Free State Project, and Free Aid at Bitcon in 2013. And then uh, we also sort of do our own projects, like Hoodie the Homeless is sort of like if you buy a Bitcoin Not Bombs t-shirt, each t-shirt pays for a hoodie to give to a homeless person. We, this is our second annual one of those. And then uh, we also just sort of do general outreach material, like the Bitcoin Quick Start Guide, or uh, we vet the various apps and companies and things in the Bitcoin industry against a kind of like libertarian standard and say like, how compliant is this company? How easy is it to keep your... your uh, Finance is private, and 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 uh, you know, can you are the how compliant are they? How uh, aggressive are they? I guess is the the thing. Um, and uh, so we're essentially just trying to hold the uh, the libertarian perspective in the Bitcoin space as long as possible, because right now it's sort of there are a lot of uh, moneyed interests trying to push the libertarian perspective out of the Bitcoin space, and uh, so that's what we do. And I will say, as Bitcoin Not Bombs, we are kind of, you know, the radical arm, um, you know, in the Bitcoin community with a lot of these things. So, uh, you know, we, we try to be the voice for radicals, I guess you could say, in a way. Um, so what are kind of some, uh, Angela kind of touched on some of the advantages of taking Bitcoin. So what are some of the advantages and how has 
taking donations in Bitcoin help you complete more projects or you know maybe go into some of the projects with antiwar.com and Bitcoin not bombs too. Well, one, because you know our finances have always been somewhat precarious because it's it's an anti -war, you know it's an anti-war group. I mean, what we do is put out educational materials on the most controversial topics. So, for us, it's allowed. Granted, there's a bit of speculation involved, but it's allowed us a bit of financial security where, if everything goes to hell, we still can keep up operations for a while. It's really, a, I mean, it. it it's a sigh of relief is what I call Bitcoin. It's a sigh of relief. And it's a way of doing things that even if other things shut down, we can continue some minimal operations. So that's for us a big, a big part of it right there. And you had some problems. One of the reasons you started taking Bitcoin is your donors were being targeted by the FBI. So in, in the event that donors get targeted or something like that, Bitcoin is kind of a way to get around some of those concerns. Yes. Uh, you want to go ahead? Well, I, I was going to talk about the disadvantages of Bitcoin, um, the volatility. The, um, so it's like it's really hard uh, from, from our perspective. We don't take dollars. So anti-war does, right? They have a, a, a cash moving through their, through their donors, through their system. We don't. We only have Bitcoin. Uh, we do that because we're sort of experimenting with it. We want to try new things. And we just want to say that we're exclusively operating in Bitcoin. That's very difficult for a lot of reasons. Um, volatility has is, is, uh, been a wild ride this year. Um, so. You know, last year we did really well in our fundraiser simply because the price went from 100 to to 1,000 in the time that we happened to be raising money. So we really benefited from that. And this year, um, volatility has been uh, uh, not in our favor. So that's just kind of interesting that uh, it's something you look at as an organization, like what what can you do to, uh, to to get around that? And there are starting to become tools that don't require me to go or don't require us to go into dollars to to to, to hedge against that uh, volatility. Um, there's more and more services coming online that uh, that offer that type of stuff, and I'm really excited for the future in which I can we can successfully use Bitcoin and Bitcoin only. But at the moment, it's certainly uh, not easy. Could you elaborate maybe on some of those services that are coming out? I'm thinking of um, Coinapult uh, for one. They, they have a, a service called Locks, and uh, it's not available in the United States. Although if you know how to use a VPN, you can get into their uh, you can set up an account with them, and uh, you can put uh, Bitcoins into uh, their account and lock them to uh, an asset, whether it be gold, uh, silver, or US dollar, or euros. So just, there'll be no float. So if I had locked a Bitcoin at $600 when their service came online this past June, uh, I'd still have $600 worth of value in that same amount of Bitcoin, even though Bitcoins are uh, 440 or whatever they are right now. Um, so, yes? Are you looking for vendors? that accepts Bitcoin, so that Bitcoin not bombs? Yeah, uh, we pretty much only use vendors that take Bitcoin. Yeah. And, uh, oh, okay, but those vendors will price their services in dollars. Sure. So if somebody sure. orders a pre-order product that's going to ship in a month, and I need to pay the ship, the U.S. shipping cost to the U.S. Postal Service, I need that, that, that $20 to ship internationally, and I need it to stay $20 to ship internationally. Otherwise, I just lost money. If the price goes down, now the price goes up. I made money, but you know it doesn't. It, it works both ways, so you know I, I I can't predict the future. Does that does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Would you want to add any challenges that you've seen, kind of working in the Bitcoin space or dealing mostly in Bitcoin? Uh, I mean, yeah, volatility is really the 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 hardest one. So, like libertarians know about um, keeping assets in gold and silver, right? And we watch you know, the charts of gold and silver. So Bitcoin is like that, but like at 10 times the speed. So um, sometimes it's up and like, you know, you, um, you, got, you receive the Bitcoin when Bitcoin was 300, you spent the Bitcoin when Bitcoin was 1000, and you, you sort of get this windfall in your, in your project. And then other times, like Bitcoin will sort of like languish around $400 for six months. And um, if, if you did some of your fundraising before that happened, then you lost money around uh, around that. I guess that's sort of the main one. I guess the other thing is is that by, um, I guess to clarify, we take dollars at the table, but that's because we're going to put it right into that ATM. On the website, we only take Bitcoin. But uh, because of that, we're sort of, it's a niche fundraising venue, right? So it, like a lot of times a person will say like, well, I have PayPal, can I donate? And it's sort of hard to like leave money on the table. Um, but, um, yeah, I guess, I mean, there, it's not that, it hasn't been that difficult. <laughs> um, it's also instantaneous. I mean, like, we get uh, orders internationally. We can send money internationally. So there's a lot of advantages, too. Um, yeah, I guess that's it. 
So, uh, Angela, you mentioned earlier about the problems with scams uh, in the libertarian community, and we're starting to see this a lot in the Bitcoin community, too, because it's such a new space. We're seeing, it, you know, it's ripe for scammers, unfortunately. So we're seeing a lot of people coming in with very, you know, idealistic sounding projects, things like that. And people are being ripped off and it's become a problem. And this is kind of where the debate with regulation kind of comes in because a lot of people believe, you know, you at least need to have a government in some capacity to prevent people from being ripped off. And what we would kind of like to see is more of a push for internal regulation. So I wanna kind of shift to a discussion about ethics and best practices. So what are the, some of the ways that your organization stays transparent and accountable? Well, with us, part of the thing is that antiwar.com has been around for a long time, and we do what we say we're going to do, which is we keep publishing the news every single day. The site never goes down, and we've been hacked before, so we've been offline for a few minutes, but we've never stopped. We've never stopped when family relatives die, when there's personal crises, it doesn't matter. We're antiwar.com is consistent rock. But part of the reason is, is that we were founded by a group of people who had long histories as libertarian activists. They're people that other people in the community know. And if you don't know our founders, you probably know Scott Horton or me or Jason Ditz. It's really, really important in the libertarian world that you know the people you're working with and you take your time and establish trust and you get to know them and you know things about their personal lives too because you can judge people. You know, how they treat their spouses and families and, and children is how they're ultimately going to treat you in business. So you need to ju make, make judgments about how people live their lives before you get into business with them. The libertarian world, and this happens all the time, I've been doing this for, I've been in this business a very long time and we often see situations where young, dynamic, charismatic, good-looking people will jump on the scene and there's all kinds of excitement about him or her. There's all kinds of promises made and then before you know it, people are either ripped off or disappointed or over-promising and under-delivering or they drift from project to project and there's never any completion or accountability and they're constantly asking for money for their this, that, and the other. But you ask yourself, what are they producing? Go for less glitz, less glamour. Go for people who prove themselves as hard workers, who deliver, who've got a series, where you can look back and say, this is what he or she did on his or her resume. You know, it's funny, you know, this is maybe a general libertarian thing, but I see a lot of libertarians in this room who've been in the movement for a while. When we hire at antiwar.com, you know, we're looking at various things, but one of the things I look at it as a resume, uh, is the resume, and I think about our former editor, John Glazer, who's amazing, and he's at the Cato Institute, you should check him out. But one of the reasons why, for example, John was hired was, I could see things like Institute for Humane Studies, the Cato Institute, and other things that suggested that he, that, that he knew how to meet, make deadlines, that there were other people that I could talk to in the movement to verify his work, and that we knew that he was capable of doing the workload. And these are all things that you want to look, with, look at before you get involved in some Bitcoin charity where do you know the people involved? Do they have a track record of being able to deliver? And these are things that you can't just always tell by the books. Sometimes books can be meticulously kept. But that's not necessarily the most important thing because underneath it you don't know what's going on necessarily. Though in keeping, keeping books is not that hard and if books require six people to read them, then something's up, either with sloppiness or scamming. But actually take your time to get to know the people involved. Don't necessarily be the first person on the bandwagon. It's like with fashion. Don't be the first person to ad adapt wide lapels, for example. Be, the f be later in adapting wide lapels. See what they look like first. See if that style is gonna hold in a few years. Be exercise caution, be a little more risk adverse. We don't have to be thought leaders. In fact, I'm a little suspicious of kind of the whole, you know, crazy dynamism of, oh my God, we're thought leaders in Bitcoin. Test it first, be practical, be reasonable, and use good judgment. And if something in your gut is telling you that he or she can't deliver, there's something with this project that seems off, go with the gut feeling every single time. So yeah, I guess I would say, um, this is sort of answering both questions, the subject of scams and the subject of shortcomings is, um, security is a major issue with Bitcoin. It's sort of a new industry and there are not quite industry standards in the realm of security. And so there's a lot of sort of opportunistic hackers out there who hack people's account. Um, I had a personal account hacked at Porkfest and that account had money that was slated for Bitcoin, not bombs in it. And so like, that's an issue. Um, but then that also sort of plays into the subject of reputation, right, or the, or the people involved. So, like, 
Drew was, before we were doing Bitcoin Up Bombs, Drew was doing Don't Tread on Meme, and a lot of people knew him from that, and there was the whole dime card project, so he has this sort of reputation in alternative currencies before we even get into Bitcoin. And then a lot of people know me from shinybadges.com, like, and so they sort of have an understanding that I'm like this person who is at the very least invested in the liberty movement financially and accustomed to, you know, meeting my customers' expectations and fulfilling these orders and making things right when there's a dispute and things like that. So when my account got when my account got hacked and some of that money was Bitcoin not bombs, I took money from my personal assets and I and I refunded it. Right? That's how that's how I make the damage hole, and that I think speaks to um, at least my reputation. I hope. Um, but the fact of the matter is is that it was my own fault for not taking security seriously on my personal wallet. And a lot of people have had there's like sour grapes about Bitcoin because people are given these sorts of pie in the sky promises about the security of the protocol and they don't think about the security of their email or the security of their PC or the security of their phone or the security of the Wi-Fi network or the security of like the entire infrastructure outside of the Bitcoin protocol that uh, is necessary for it to function. And so that stuff is sort of being hashed out now and being resolved now and um, you know part of uh, uh, part of uh, freedom is responsibility, right? And so you have to, you have to, if you're going to say that you don't need a bank to secure your funds, then you have to be willing to take security seriously yourself. And that can sometimes involve a, a learning curve. Yeah, I would just say that, uh, yeah, we don't, we don't think about what a bank goes through, what Wells Fargo does to keep my dollars safe. Um, I don't think about it on a daily basis. Um, so if you don't think about what you have to do now to uh, to keep your Bitcoin safe, then you're, you may be in a world of hurt. I guess the question was about um, scammers and fraudsters. I think one thing you might be talking about are, are some of the altcoins that are coming out. If um, if you're new to Bitcoin, stay there. Um, don't don't venture into uh, into the, the uncharted territory of, of all these alternative coins. There's a lot of scams there. There's a lot of interesting stuff. There's a lot of fun stuff you can read about. There, there will be uh, other coins to Bitcoin. There may be something that uh, uh, removes Bitcoin or replaces it. Uh, so don't venture anything you're not willing to lose. I mean, is yeah, that the rule of thumb? Yeah, I think so. It, I, I mean, that's just a general advice I, I would give. But um, yeah, I think um, to sort of come out of that and, and, and what what these scams have have taught us and everyone in this in this space, um, products are getting better, wallets are getting better, security is getting better. It's being baked in uh, things you. Things you used to have to think about in your Bitcoin wallet, you don't have to think about anymore. There are better wallets now. Um, there's better services. Uh, so these things, over time, uh, we're finding all of these bumps in the road. Davi found a very large bump. A lot of other people have found these bumps in the road. And uh, so the companies out there that are innovating uh, new wallets and different software and, and hardware are providing options that, that help people. You have a question? Um, yeah. Um, first of all, I'll answer it. I, I trust local Bitcoins sure. and the blockchain. Blockchain.info with some of my private keys. So I was going to ask the four of you: Are there businesses, uh, websites, whatever that you trust with your private keys? I'm not inclined to trust anyone else with my private keys. Um, I tell that to everyone. I think there are services like Coinbase who make it very easy to use uh, for people who are less tech savvy. But I think it's really worth it to educate yourself on protecting your own private keys. And there are a few things I, I wanted to quickly uh, go over, some just simple things that you can do to protect your Bitcoin wallets and your email addresses. And things like two-factor authentication. Um, you know, in something like Gmail, this is a, just a matter of, you know, clicking on a setting. Um, it, it's made, you know, it's very easy to use. You can put layers of security above and beyond that. Uh, Blockchain.info is a good wallet service, uh, you know, that allows, and, and most other ones too. I mean, you want to can add layers. Just a second. Can I get a show of hands? How many people know what two-factor authentication is? Okay. It's, okay how many so people know what a private key room. is? Okay, cool. I just want to okay. kind of gauge, like I want to define my terms if a lot of people don't know. That's all. How many yeah, people control you. their own private keys? How many people rely on a third-party service to hold their private keys for them? A few are willing to admit it. But, that's, that, but there's nothing wrong with that. If, right, if, right. If, if, if a service... If there weren't this services, so we, there's this new rule, we're not allowed to talk about the wallet services we use in our charity because then a hacker would watch this video and know what wallet services we use. That's kind of a new ground rule. But uh, if the services uh, that, that allowed antiwar.com to take uh, Bitcoin didn't 
do that for Angela, the learning curve would have been huge. She was able to set up an account in 15 minutes and 15 minutes later accept Bitcoin. It was a just easy process. But had the process had to come, well, first I need to teach you what a private key is and how to properly manage it and how to do disk security and, and, and to keep this data safe on your computer. She had never taken, the adoption curve was just, the difficulty was too, would be too high and anti-war would have never accepted. So these services are pretty valuable. Butler, you have a question? Yeah, I collapse of the established order continues, I think one of the things everyone needs to be uh, well in touch with is to identify who your friends are. And I mean really friends. And Leonard Liggio, uh, who sadly died about a week or so ago, but had a really good response to that. Who would you call a friend? And he said, somebody who wouldn't call the police on you. And well, that was pretty good. But just this past week, uh, the latest enemy of the week, uh, ISIS, uh, was reported to have been starting a new uh, monetary system based upon gold and silver. And right away, my response was, aha, the provocateurs are at it already uh, to discredit any kind of alternative monetary system. Do you, have you had any response to that, or do you see any? Um, actually, there was an interview done uh, by, oh gosh, I think it was TechCrunch or Wired or something, interviewing a guy named Amir Taki, and the reporter really wanted to focus on, oh, well, can a group like ISIS use Bitcoin for money laundering, stuff like that. The answer is yes. I mean, if they really wanted to, that technology could be used. but. I mean, you could do cash. I mean, there are a lot, it's, it's, it's one of those things that the media is using to paint Bitcoin in a negative light, I think, because in all, you know, in all honesty, people aren't going to probably learn this new technology for that express purpose. There are easier ways that they can launder money right now that don't involve Bitcoin. So I view it as kind of, when the media asks these questions of Bitcoiners, it's to inspire fear and the same kind of terrorism narrative we've, you know, we're used to knowing is kind of false. I well, mean, it's so here's terrorists. the thing about about this particular bugbear. If you talk to economists or read like you know like traditional economists, they'll talk about the the features of money, right? And they'll talk about the stability and the liquidity, and you know that it's divisible and fungible and all of these things. No one in the history of economics has ever said that the role of money is to police the world. Right. <laughs> but now people are saying like, oh, well, if you're going to start a new monetary system, that monetary system needs to be able to police the world. And it needs the, the unit of currency itself must be able to prevent itself from being used by bad actors. Like that's an absurd economic claim. Right. Um, it would not surprise me at all if ISIS was using gold and silver. Um, Anti-Western movements throughout the Middle East have often attempted to return to gold and silver to uh, you know, avoid the dollar hegemony. Uh, Muammar Gaddafi famously wanted to do a pan-African gold dinar. Um, there have been various movements of that sort. But that's the thing, like, that, like to use that as a political lever against gold and silver is absurd, right? <laughs> because it's an element, it's like a thing on a periodic table. You know, <laughs> so like to say that the gold has a responsibility to not be used by terrorists is insane. The same way that to say that Bitcoin as a protocol has a responsibility to not be used by terrorists is insane. It's math. It's a program. You know, like you may as well say like a baseball bat has an ob has an obligation not to be used by a terrorist baseball team. Or a like, gun too. Right. Guns kill people. right. right. So um, yes, people that buy bad things buy bad things with money. <laughs> but that's, it's unavoidable. It's, it's, uh, it's an absurd argument. Yeah, and it is an argument that's unfortunately going to continue to be used, you know, to demonize Bitcoin and discourage people from using it. But ultimately, it, like Davi said, it, it's a tool. It doesn't really make much sense to demonize it. Um, so I, I wanted to kind of shift back to kind of ethics. You know, we were, uh, you know, how, how can you kind of balance donor privacy and also be accountable accountable to the community because there's all of these different you know ways in which you can uh, appear accountable and we'll maybe briefly you know Drew can go into this uh, you know talking about multi signature wallets we'll kind of explain that but how how do you, how does like anti war balance that because donor privacy is an issue um, here, so. oh well donor privacy is a huge issue for us given the, the controversial nature of what we do I mean there's no circumstances ever in which we would re 
reveal donor information or reveal our donors. That's why one of the reasons why you know we have a relationship with the ACLU right now because there's no circumstances ever in which we would turn over our information to the FBI. Um, Bitcoin is a different, it's a little bit of a challenge. I don't know who all of our Bitcoin donors are. There are people in the movement who've made it a point to give us in Bitcoin, and, but even today I meet people here at this event saying, hey, I donated to you in Bitcoin. I don't know who these people are. And I, you know, I, can't, I can't say, am I taking Bitcoin from a bad place or a bad actor? I have no idea in most cases. But um, Bitcoin's not completely anonymous or perfectly private. And what we do on our end is we keep lots of, keep, you know, keep all emails, a keep memos, keep track of them. I mean, literally just keep track of things so that you can show people, these are the steps I took, these are the people I spoke to, and this is what we did with the money. Because we're a 501c3, and as much as, you know, most of us on staff absolutely loathe dealing with the state in any way, shape, or form, not everyone we deal with is an anarchist. Um, it's not everyone, you know, I mean, our audience is bigger and broader than that. So we, you know, we file 990s. We have W-2s. You can see things very clearly. So there's no, there's, there's no games played. We have actual accountants and bookkeepers who look at things. And that's really, really important because people are giving you money and you're being entrusted with it. So that's why, I mean, it's, it's open. But also, too, I mean... I mean, anti-Warakam may go too big, and the other, we may be a little hyper-transparent. I mean, very few organizations in the libertarian movement have staffers argue with each other on, on Twitter. So we just uh, we try to keep it real, if nothing else. It's entertaining, though. Follow them on Twitter. It's very entertaining. <laughs> so I, I think this is your department. Yeah, so I also wanted to get back to your question about um, where you save your, your funds and private keys. Um, it's... Uh, based on what uh, the, the hands that were raised, I think all of you know or at least have heard of multi-signature. If not, basically what it is is um, not necessarily two people, but you can have two keys, two of three keys. And if you sign a transaction with two of these three keys, uh, it's an added layer of uh, security. So Davi and I could enter into an agreement that we wouldn't spend this fund until he signs off on it and I sign off on it. And as a backup, Megan could have a key. So if Davi decides to leave this plane of existence, Megan could step in and, and sign that transaction for him. So that, that's, uh, that's the gist of multi-sig. Uh, and everybody said 2014 was going to be the year of multi-sig. Unfortunately, it was the year for the developers to get going with multi-sig. And there still aren't a lot of consumer-friendly applications of this technology for you to just sort of use and play with. There are a few things out there. Uh, BitGo is one that is uh, at least marketing their product and they believe in their product. Uh, some of the others like BitPay's Copay, they tell you, well, it's beta, don't trust it. So I don't, I don't really want to deal with, with software. I don't want to suggest software that even the company is telling you it's not ready for prime time. So um, that stuff is, is coming. I'm happy to say that anti-war is slowly moving towards multi-signature and some of their funds are currently behind that. Uh, and that's great. That's, um, you know, they actually, you know, they, they receive more money than we do and there's a reason for that. They do a lot more than we do and they deserve it. And um, it's good to know it, it helps us all sleep at night to know that their funds are starting to be uh, more secure and behind those technologies. Again, it's just not e ready for prime time. I'm sort of waiting for one of my favorite providers, CoinKite, to uh, roll out their multi-signature offering, which they're supposed to uh, this month or next. And so I'm, I'm eager uh, to, to put some funds behind that. But again, it's not really ready for prime time. And uh, you do, uh, in anti-war's case, you give up a little bit of privacy, uh, internal privacy, when you, when you use those services and, and their servers uh, for that type of stuff. But that stuff is coming, and I'm, I'm, I'm eager to, uh, to put our funds behind that. But I wanted to show this off, and uh, maybe we could talk later at the table if anyone had questions. But this little device is called a Trezor. It's, uh, it's, a, it's translated into Vault, but it's uh, just a little piece of uh, a USB hardware device uh, that I can't spend the Bitcoins on this device without this physical device uh, hooked up to my computer. And it adds uh, sort of a secondary layer of security. And at the moment, this is uh, not this one in particular, but this, uh, this device is what's housing um, Bitcoin up bombs is funds that are, some of it is actually that we do have a hot wallet that's online. That's a, that, that's security risk in that, but uh, that's pretty mitigated and, and fairly safe system. And then this is what I'm using uh, as a backup, but not this device. I left the, uh, the one with the funds at home. The other neat thing about this product is I have uh, my cell phone set up to only receive, to only receive funds for this device. So I could have this device in a safe in the hotel room or back home, and I can carry my cell phone around with me and have no risk of accepting Bitcoins. And the cell phone app in my phone has no private key information, has no ability to send 
funds so I could collect them while I'm out here and selling t-shirts and whatnot, but again, there's nothing, if my phone gets stolen or lost or damaged, there's no way that those funds will somehow go missing from my cell phone. So that's just a fun little hardware tool that I, that I personally have, have found and trust. I've been only using it for a few weeks, so you know, take, don't take my word for it. Do some more uh, research on the different hardware wallets that are out there, but there's a few, and there are more that are coming next year. So again, the as these problems really get flushed out and people experience these problems, uh, then there's somebody there looking to innovate around it and, and create a, a product for it. Yeah, and that's something we're seeing a lot of in the space. And it is unfortunate that, you know, a lot of people are succumbing to some of these scams, but there's a lot of, you know, internal governance structures that are, that are being voluntarily set up too. Um, so what kind of security standards do you see being set by the community in the next coming months to protect supporters and clients of you know, blockchain tech using organizations? Uh, the gist of it was what do I see coming? Um, I mean, that's, multi-sig is it, uh, that they, they, can't, they can't release this fast enough. Um, uh, you know, you mentioned about transparency and such. Uh, yes, you can make notes in the blockchain and it's a public ledger and you can use that public ledger uh, to your benefit, but don't, you keep your own books. Um, that's, that, you know, it's, it's not a, a substitute for that. You need to keep your own books. Um, so, uh, but uh, again, I, I'm at a waiting point for multi-sig. I mean, I really, mm -hmm. I can't, I've, we've played around with BitGo. Um, we, we've implemented one of their wallets. I like it. It has a lot of cool features. Um, the, the question came down, so a lot of these services are, they, you, if you read through their terms and condition, they don't offer insurance, it's not, there's, not, there's no FDIC here, uh, and it says clear as day in their terms of service, this is your responsibility, and if you lose your funds or you mismanage or you, your fault, your problem, do not call us, we, we, there's nothing we can do. And, uh, and that's them protecting you know, their company, and it's, it's understandable, it's an, a, a risk you assume, it's a responsibility you assume. Uh, but what do you pay, like what's the salary of the person who's in charge for all of your funds? Like what, you know, so to bring in this technical, the security officer. So if you're a small organization, you know, Megan, Davi, and myself are, none of us are computer science majors. Uh, you know, you, to bring in somebody to manage that sort of technology, which is what you have to do at this point to, to implement something like that. Like, it's just another cost, it's another burden. Um, so it's not user friendly. I think when we get to a point where it's user friendly, you'll see sort of spontaneous organizations, or you'll see spontaneous fundraising, which doesn't, doesn't need a label or a name or an organization, but the tools and the technology will be there for people to quickly raise funds for, you know, whatever, a disaster or, you know, somebody needs help uh, locally in their community and they need, you know, help paying the rent or whatever it is. Um, these technologies are gonna help people just sort of spontaneously raise money for, for their efforts. But again, they don't. They 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 need maybe two th two or three people to agree that this is what we're going to do with the money. They can create a multi-signature account. They can ask people to donate to it, and then they can fulfill their commitment by you know them spending that money on whatever it is they said they were going to do it on. But these technologies, again, I'm still sort of waiting. Paul over here at Airbits is uh, talking about multi-signature, rolling that out in his wallet. But again, it's you know kind of something that's uh, coming down the pipe, and we can't really play with yet. And, you know, ultimately we're, we're seeing, I think some of you are familiar with the New York regulations that will be cracking down on the exchanges. And the calls for external regulation are growing stronger among some people in the community and even people outside of it. And there are a lot of organizations now, it is kind of like a Wild West in kind of a good way and a bad way in that, you know, there are a lot of people, a lot of anarchists, a lot of ideological anarchists who are saying, you know, we don't want certain government statuses, like you mentioned the 501c3, uh, you know, designation earlier, not a lot of people are wanting to jump on board with that. But at the same time, that's not an excuse to not be accountable to the people in the community. So while we can talk about, you know, being ideological anarchists all day long, if we're not internally governing ourselves and our organizations, then, you know, we're, we're not going to be trustworthy. And, you know, it, you don't have to be, you don't have to file the government paper, paperwork to be a trustworthy organization, but you do need to take certain standards, um, you know, and, and very strictly apply them. So, that, because it does come down to reputation within the community. I was just going to add, um, one of the ways that people know um, donations are going on from Bitcoin to antiwar.com is Drew set up, help set up this um, bot that is on, we, on Twitter, we're antiwar.com, and I'm at antiwar2, so that you can see that, oh, so-and-so just donated. Now, it doesn't say so-and-so, because obviously it's, it's you know, the way of nature of Bitcoin, but someone just donated 0.2 Bitcoin to antiwar.com. It's right there. Everyone can see it. It can be retweeted. 
And it creates also, too, excitement because people want to donate to something that they know is functional, thriving, and healthy. So it really actually has been a tremendous help to us. And that's one of the great services that these guys provide. So please, uh, you know, that's my little pitch for... Um, we for make branding tools. <laughs> We'd love to help your organization brand better. Butler. Oh, I'm sure you know the offender of scammers, liars, frauds, thieves. Anyone like that, which probably is why I have no use for the state. But one of the advantages, I think, Appreciate of having... And knowing that there are people like this running around loose is that it makes us more skeptical um, in, in, in general. You, you, you're forced into a situation where you have to put more reliance on your own thinking, on the evidence that you're going to act upon and so forth. And whenever I hear people say, well, yeah, but you saw that on, on the Internet. You can't trust the Internet. And I said, unlike CNN, NBC, the LA Times and so forth, you know, you got to be skeptical with all these, uh, all of these people. And I think that the fact that there are people like that out there uh, has a beneficial consequence. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. It's Mark Twain all over, right? Those who right. don't read the no news are uninformed. Those who read the news are misinformed. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Think. Ernie yeah. has a question. I, I, just to I know it probably wouldn't be appropriate for you guys to, uh, as Bitcoin Not Bombs, to endorse a particular app or wallet and stuff, but I'm wondering if you guys, uh, I think it would be great for you to have a criteria, you know, like a checklist, and then given a, a rating of, uh, you know, some, this is what we need multi-sig, we need to have privacy, we need to be wallet champ, blah, 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 and each one where they rate on that or something as a guide, because nobody else has that for us. So and I'm looking rubric, for essentially, right, like a grid, got them, need them, got them, got Right, 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 because right. yeah. I'm looking for, you know, I need the grandma just button, man, that is yeah. my big thing, you know. So, so Paul asked this question from Airbits, and he said, you know, what's the criteria to be in your, in your quick start guide, and this is, you know, it's just a trifold pamphlet, and it has a few suggestions for wallets you could open. It has services where you can buy stuff, you know, and it has services where you can buy bitcoins, and it's just good general information. And you know, so Paul's question was, well, how, what's the criteria for being in there? And then on the front, if you look at it, these are characteristics of the Bitcoin protocol. Bitcoin, it's a distributed network. It's instant tran transfers. They're global markets. There's no free frozen accounts, and they're free to start. This is a description of Bitcoin, the protocol, not a wallet, not any particular service. This is just a description of the protocol itself, and it elaborates on the back with the honey badger meme, and you just have to read it to understand that. But if a wallet doesn't follow and have these features that the protocol has, then it's not Bitcoin. If, um, if your wallet... Uh, won't allow you to, you know, can freeze your funds, then it's not Bitcoin. If your wallet uh, is not a distributed network, if you can't do an instant transfer of money, if it's not a global market, if, if your wallet provider limits any of these features, then you're not using Bitcoin. You're using, you're, you're using Bitcoin the currency in somebody else's system. You're not using the Bitcoin payment system. Uh, and that is, th this is, these are the, the features of that system, and your wallet should have all of those features in it. And if it does, then it's Bitcoin. If it doesn't, then it's something else. Yeah, so, that was really good. Go to ahead. just speak to the idea of a Venn diagram, we don't, we don't have that yet, but I definitely think that's something that we've been discussing over the course of this weekend. And I want to see that happen, where um, you take like maybe the top 20 available wallets and the top 20 available exchanges and the top 20 available uh, merchant sites and say, like, just how, how do they rank up against these issues that are important to us? Like, how... How do they, and that way, like, it isn't about endorsing a specific wallet. It's about a one-stop shop for all of the answers to the questions that are important to you as a privacy and liberty concerned user. So that, uh, like, maybe multi-sig is not important to you because you're a sole proprietor and there's nobody else to sign, right? But the idea that you don't need to give personal information, that is important to you. So it isn't that we as an organization would like endorse this one because it has multi-sig and doesn't require personal information but it would be that we said sort of in a for, sort of full disclosure way because it isn't always on the front of everybody's website these are the ones we found that do require personal information so before you go looking there know that and if and, if, and just use the list so we're gonna i'm gonna work on compiling that list in the next couple of weeks and um, I think it'll be a good visual guide for that way. The user is the one deciding their priorities. We are not deciding their priorities. Can I endorse it? Yeah. Pay for it. Get an ad on it. 
Yeah, and you know, as we see these kind of scammers nope. come and go, the services will will follow that. So you know, I think there's going to be. I, I would hope to see more stability in the next coming year, um, as far as you know, legit companies coming out who are you know, it, it's a very young space, so it's it's hard to kind of have that trust with just about any companies because you know it just hasn't been around that long. So I think that's going to be get better, and I would like to see a rating systems of sort too. So. Yeah, this is Morpheus. Anyway, what do you see as, I'd like to get your opinions on, what do you see Bitcoin being in the next year, five years, 10 years for each one of you? Like the price? Yeah. If I knew that, I wouldn't be here. I would take a guess. I can't predict the future. It's gonna do one of two things, go up or down. <laughs> or stay the same, but it never stays the same. Um, Honestly, like the things that I thought would affect the price uh, haven't affected the price in the last year. When you see like big companies like Dell sign on or you see eBay making whispers about taking it, you would expect that to have a dramatic effect on the price as we saw in previous years and it hasn't, which makes me wonder if like we're kind of moving out of a volatility phase, which is good. Like I would rather predict stability than predict uh, increase in value. Like for me, the stability of the thing is more valuable <laughs> than, the valuable, <laughs> than the value of the thing. Um, but here's the other thing, and this sort of speaks to what we're going to see in the realm of security every year, or in the next year, but a lot of people are turning to the state uh, for security. <laughs> and so whatever, that is, that, is like, that is a wild card in any market, right? Like people, people retract from economic activity when there's uh, regulatory uncertainty, and there is regulatory uncertainty. So the fact that we're going to be seeing increasing or, or sort of new rollouts in the next year, five years, of what the regulations are gonna be and how we're gonna move around them, um, that's gonna be a, a level of volatility and uncertainty. So yeah, you really, you can't, you can't predict, um, but I do, I hope, and I, I guess I'll sort of predict that we're going to see more stability than we saw in the previous five years because, I mean, it, it's, it's been insane. It's been a roller coaster up till now and it seems like, it seems like the peaks and valleys are, are getting smaller over time. So that's the best I can do. Um, I can't really speak to the price or anything like that. I think we are going to see a more hostile regulatory climate. I think there's going to be more push for regulation, but at the same time, we're going through a lot of these growing pains. And as far as the you know, social aspect of it, the kind of community aspect in Bitcoin, we're seeing a lot a lot more kind of tempering of our enthusiasm across the board and I think that's a really good thing. I think be people are becoming more skeptical and I think we're going to see still probably a lot of scams, a lot of people coming into space, but a lot more skepticism and I think we're going to see more kind of voluntarily, voluntarily applied internal regulations and I think that's a really good thing and it'll also help stabilize the space more to allow people who, you know, who maybe they don't want to hold their private keys or maybe you know they don't want to do certain things it feels safer coming into uh into the space without that kind of government regulation one more any questions what's your opinion angela angela do you have an opinion on the price no okay. <laughs> <laughs> up down stay the same any more questions any questions are we All right, well, thanks everyone. Uh, check out Bitcoin.bombs and Antonio.com. And donate to antiwar.com. Yes. Thank you for watching this presentation. Visit Roberts and Roberts online at rrbi.co for all your precious metals needs. Roberts and Roberts not only accepts Bitcoin, they prefer it. If you enjoyed this video, also consider donating to Red Pill Productions.